resources. The future gives us tremendous opportunities over the long term, and we want to move forward towards a society that reuses its waste and turns them into resources. This week, our commissioner for the environment, Commissioner Veya, and the deputy director, Keya, along with 90 representatives from this sector, from 14 different member states, accompanied by organizations like the Ellen MacArthur Organization in today's discussion, and large companies as well. The objective is to promote work towards a circular economy. And I have Jocelyn Blariot next to me here who's going to explain to us exactly what that transition means. On my left here, I have Katarina Fortune, our expert on the financing tools in the European Union. She'll explain how we can get financing for these projects, these environmental projects. Now, what we want to do today is to have an exchange of an ideas and best practices at national level with participation from many different Spanish regions. And we also want to present innovative projects in the area of circular economy. This is a real exchange of knowledge and network networking, fostering synergies and collaboration. We also have a specific objective, another specific objective, which is the celebration of the uh, these meetings. We have an exhibit with 11 experiences and best practices in circular economy where we'll have the opportunity to listen to those who are um, who are developing these initiatives. I also would like to welcome today all of those who are listening to us on the web. This is being web streamed. So welcome to all of you as well, all of you who are watching and listening to us. Now, without further ado, we're going to give Jocelyn the floor to tell us something about the transition of the economy. Hola. Muchas gracias por su Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm Jocelyn Blerio, and I work for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, focusing on circular economy. And now I'd like to speak in English, with your permission. So I don't know if this is working. I had a, maybe here. Yeah, so as Jorgen was saying, we're, uh, live uh, on the web as part of the Foundation's Disruptive Inno Innovation Festival. So uh, obviously a lot of people around the world are watching this session right here. And a lot of people are running around trying to get the screen working. So I am confident we'll get there. Uh, there we go. So the foundation is a not-for-profit organization. We're based on the Isle of Wight in the UK, and uh, our sole purpose is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. Uh, so I'll go into a bit more detail when it comes to the opportunities of such a model and what exactly we're uh, meaning when we talk about circular economy. Of course, the first uh, reflex uh, when one hears the expression circular economy is to think about material flows and productive loops and recycling and material handling. So it's true there's a big element of that. But by the same token, it, it can't be reduced to, that, uh, to those material flows. And it's a much more complex picture because, of course, it's a system shift that we're talking about. And, this is the, uh, the diagram that we've put together in order to try and explain what this circular economy actually looks like at systems level. So as you see, there are many different loops, uh, different loops of different values of different materials. And there is a, a divide between the uh, biological cycle on the left and the technical cycle on the right. It's important to get that distinction because 
Of course, if you uh, mix up all the elements, then the material flows are less efficient and you lose a lot of value in the process if you can't separate them at the end of their useful life and re-inject them in the productive loops. One thing that was very interesting when we started uh, putting some figures on that model is the fact that if you look at the, uh, the outer loop on the, on the right of the diagram, which is about recycling, it's really, really far away on the right because we uh, and the circular economy model consider that it's the loop of the last resort in the sense that in order to break down the materials, the products to, the, uh, to their material uh, state, uh, it involves a lot of energy and a lot of value is lost in the process. So actually, it might be counterintuitive at first, but the fact is that the value really lies way before recycling in the reuse, in keeping the materials and products at their highest quality and, and the highest level of use. So, of course, that has an impact on the way products are designed because it, they need to be designed to be disassembled and, and reprocessed, upgraded, remanufactured. And the business models as well do change in the sense that it's more uh, based on the use and the maximization of the utilization rate of the assets rather than just simply deriving value from selling more and more stuff. Maybe it's a question of selling the access to the products rather than the products themselves, in which case the consumer becomes a user and uh, the product gets uh, more useful lives and maybe more life cycles as well. So if the collection rates are uh, increased as well, there is a massive, massive economic opportunity. Now on the left, what we see as well is the fact that we can do much better uh, by way of capturing value in the organic material streams. Most of the time, uh, organic uh, byproducts just get either landfilled or burned, and actually that bypasses a lot of uh, value extraction opportunities because now with the growing trend of biorefineries and biotechnologies, there are a lot of high-value molecules that can be extracted from uh, organic products. And also, of course, the fact that a lot of the nutrients currently don't go back to agricultural land means that there's a, a loss of uh, soil productivity, which is uh, constantly on the rise. And the uh, reliance on chemical fertilizers is problematic as well, because, of course, they are from finite stocks. And they tend to have a, a negative effect on soil productivity as well in the long term. So once we had done this uh, initial mapping of the circular economy loops, what we wanted to do was to get an idea of how that translates in terms of figures and, and economic opportunity. And we teamed up with uh, the consulting firm McKinsey and Company to, give us a, to ask them to give us a quantification of that opportunity. And the first report that we produced was uh, published in January 2012 and it looked at the opportunities of a circular economy applied to the manufacturing sector in Europe, uh, specifically uh, to uh, look at one product category which uh, Eurostat poetically calls medium-lived complex goods, which is your smartphone, your washing machine, light commercial vehicle. And that represents about 48% of European GDP. And what we found was that for that uh, sector alone, by adding one life cycle to the product and upping collection rate a bit, but not doing any major tweaks to design or any major legislation uh, changes, the opportunity in material savings was around $380 billion a year. Uh, we're talking about dollars because, of course, it's the currency that McKinsey works with. And uh, that was the conservative scenario. And with uh, design changes and more enabling conditions put together by legislation, then we can increase that figures to more than 600 billion a year. And that was quite impressive. And of course, that very first uh, report actually uh, was the document that uh, got us to open a dialogue with the European Commission in the first place. Ellen MacArthur herself presented that to five commissioners and as a result, we're invited to sit on the uh, European Resource Efficiency Platform put together by Commissioner Potoshnik. He was Commissioner for the Environment at the time. The 
second uh, sector that we looked at was the FMCG sector, fast moving consumer goods, so cosmetics, food, uh, clothing to a certain extent. And we took a, a global look at this sector uh, because it was more relevant. And actually what we saw was that in terms of input, 80% uh, of the material inputs that go into that sector at global level every year, 80% of that gets discarded and never gets reused, never gets reprocessed. So only 20% of what goes in, and it's a huge value, we're talking three trillions of dollars here, only 20% of that gets captured. So it's a massive, massive wasted opportunity. And that quantification led to the realization that actually our linear model of taking stuff, making products and discarding them, which has been very successful over the course of the Industrial Revolution, lifting billions of people out of poverty, that was starting to bump against some physical limits. And also, of course, there are increased challenges with the uh, global population rise. And more than the actual absolute numbers is the fact that levels of consumption rise because that population uh, has access to a, a lot of uh, wealth and, and it's a great thing, but it means that middle class consumers are more and more numerous and that puts a, a pressure on the systems that we uh, depend on. Once we had done these initial quantifications, which had actually also got us into the World Economic Forum, who has a uh, seized the topic and made the circular economy one of their focus areas. We wanted to go back to uh, the European case and say if we take the levers that we've identified in our reports and if we push them uh, in an ambitious fashion, where does it get us in terms of Europe as a system? Let's imagine that Europe embraces circular economy in a, in a really uh, meaningful way. Where does it get us? And we decided to look at three sectors which were mobility, built environment and food because together they represent about 62-63% of uh, European household expenditure. And actually what surprised us uh, most of all when we dug a, a little bit deeper was not so much the economic opportunity which of course is there but what surprised us to begin with was the fact that actually we think that we live with a, within a, a model which is very efficient. And some uh, sectors, like the automotive industry, uh, typically people will think it's very mature, it's very efficient, uh, and actually it, it's almost come to the maximum of what it can uh, do in terms of saving and efficiency. But actually when you look at the figures, what we have is a model of mobility that relies mostly on private vehicles. Uh, the European uh, average for cars sitting idle is 92%, so that's, that's very, very inefficient. Cars spend more, uh, more time parked than doing anything else, and if they're not parked, they're looking for a parking space. Uh, and what, what we have is essentially is 1.2, 1.5 tons of metal and polymer, transporting on average 1.5 person, when actually it has five seats. And all of this in a very inefficient manner because the internal combustion engine is notoriously inefficient in converting energy to actual motion. So it was interesting to look at it this way. And, and also we saw that uh, if you look at increasing the share of you know, car sharing schemes or mobility which would be on demand and not necessarily relying on the fact that people own their cars, well, it changes the paradigm completely, and we, I remember having this very interesting conversation as part of this research with the chief architect of the city of Barcelona, uh, Vicente Guarart, who said that as they were increasing the number of car sharing schemes in the city, they needed less parking space for private vehicles, which meant that in some places he could increase the, uh, the, the actual size of the pavement which meant that there were more people walking and also he could reintroduce more natural services and, and ecosystems, more, more green in the city, which was a, a great unintended consequence. So all of this to explain that actually it's not only economics and hard figures, it, it really is a systemic shift and it has a, a lot of interconnected relationships. 
But of course, the figures themselves are very important as well. And we looked at, uh, still within the boundaries of these three sectors, if we push circular economic models, increase remanufacturing, and, and rely on a higher utilization rate of assets, rather than building new ones all the time when, whenever there's a need, well, you displace a lot of need for uh, virgin materials, which means that, of course, the impact on the material consumption is quite important, and the impact on CO2 emissions is important as well. And what you see on that slide here is the comparison between uh, current development path and circular economy scenario. Uh, the starting point for the figures is uh, 2012, and 2012 is the index uh, 100. So you see uh, CO2 emissions in 2030, for instance, in the uh, circular economy scenario, amounts to a 48% reduction compared to figures of 2012. And the same applies to uh, primary material consumption, which in European terms is very important because Europe is the biggest net importer of uh, raw materials and resources for its industry. So there is a, an issue of, of uh, independence when it comes to supply, but also uh, protection from volatility in markets, which is very high at the moment. Now, all of this naturally uh, is bound to have an impact on employment, but I think at this stage it's important to be realistic and, and honest about the fact that it's very, very, very difficult to give figures around uh, employment or to know there will be sectorial shifts, probably the primary sector will see some jobs disappear while the service sector and, and everything that's around materials management and, and the uh, design of products, the handling of products, reverse logistics, probably will see an increase. But it's interesting to see that this question is of course uh, at the heart of the agenda and this slide shows a, uh, a note which was put together by the uh, the French government uh, strategy office looking at circular economy and trying to quantify this. So they admit in that very document that it's very difficult to quantify. But there's an interesting idea in there which is if you want to measure the progress of your circular economy, then maybe one proxy which is good to do that is to show the number of jobs directly related to it that it creates. Having said that, there is a need to qualify what exactly is a circular economy job, otherwise you don't really know what you're talking about. You know, do the jobs that are created in uh, the traditional recycling sector count of circular economy? All of this means that if you get the right questions, you start to refine the answer as well and have the right definition of what's a circular economy, what's a circular economy job, uh, and how is actually the uh, progress that we think we are making against uh, how does it stack against reality and the figures? So the French government has put the circular economy at the heart of their energy transition law, which was adopted in August 2015, and all of this shows that there, there is a really uh, big momentum. And of course, the question of jobs uh, is difficult to tackle, but uh, there is a report by the Club of Rome uh, which quantifies that for Spain, the circular economy potential in terms of jobs could be about 400,000, mostly in uh, remanufacturing and materials handling. Remanufacturing, which is actually quite a big part of the argument as well, because if you start treating the assets as things that can be shared and have multiple users and multiple lives, they need to be designed for it, they need to be also processed in the right way. And one thing that can be said about jobs in this context is that uh, typically the um, remanufacturing happens close to the market. So th there's no point shipping products to be remanufactured at the other end of the world. They need to be, th the remanufacturing process needs to happen where the use happens. So we've seen that with examples, uh, for instance, uh, Canon, the uh, Japanese uh, photocopier uh, imagery equipment company has a remanufacturing center in Germany, for instance, and that's not exactly where the labor is the cheapest, but it doesn't make economic sense to ship the products back to Japan to be remanufactured. They have to be dealt with 
uh, where their users are in order to be economically viable. And, that, and that's working really well. So that's one of the things that can be said about jobs in a circular economy is that it tends to create local non-offshoreable jobs as well. Now, going back to the uh, European uh, side of things and the way the Commission has tackled this, uh, this is the note that uh, came out in 2012, the, one of the very first uh, manifestos for a resource efficient and ultimately circular economy in Europe. All of the work was uh, started by Janusz Potosznik in his tenure as uh, Commissioner for the Environment. And the great thing that he did is that he convened a multi-stakeholder platform, so Commission, Parliament, private businesses as well, NGOs, a lot of stakeholders. And everybody was co-creating around that common goal of the circular economy rather than say, this is what I want, this is what I want, it will end up on the lowest common denominator. If we agree on the vision of a circular economy because we believe and the figures show that it brings competitiveness for Europe, how do we co-create that? And that was a very interesting dynamic because it really led to the Commission uh, taking this, uh, this approach very seriously and uh, under Vice President Timmermans uh, last December the uh, Circular Economy Action Plan was adopted. One of the first legislations to come out of this, and it relates to the left side of the diagram that I was showing earlier, is the creation uh, for, of a market for organic fertilizers, which didn't exist previously. So finally, there, a lot of the potential of these organic byproducts is going to be harnessed. And the Commission is currently working uh, for 2017 uh, at a massive piece of legislation around plastics, which uh, is a key material uh, due to its uh, functional property, but also its volume and also its longevity and, and some other uh, potential concerns. There is a huge economic potential there as well. So working through uh, business models, investment opportunities, we'll be releasing uh, a paper on the investment opportunities for the circular economy uh, at the end of, this, uh, of December during a, uh, an official EU Commission event, so uh, more on that later. But what we see is that it, the system approach uh, is being taken very seriously and there are a lot of good signs emanating from a lot of stakeholders. Private businesses are taking this on board, legislators are taking this on board. Of course the education community has to be uh, harnessed as well because if you want this to be a long-term proposition, then you have to create the right skills and the right mindsets. But uh, I'll just finish by saying that there's a great dynamic at play, and uh, the fact that uh, I'm here today invited by uh, Katerina and Sandra to talk about this uh, is a testament to that. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope we have uh, great exchanges during the day. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joss. That was very interesting. Um, muy interesante. Very interesting. Thank you very much. If you have any questions at this stage, hold on to those, please. Because first we're going to listen to Katerina, and then we'll have our Q&A session. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. We're very happy to see you all here at this event. Here we want to share our knowledge about the circular economy from the point of view of the European Commission to tell you what we're doing collaborating with international foundations like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and national authorities, international authorities, and also with SMEs because the change is happening through you. In my presentation, I'm going to explain what we're doing at the Commission in terms of legislation. Justin also mentioned a little bit about that why we're interested in the uh, circular economy and what financing we've made available f through the uh, SMEs, uh, public and private financing. And so the second part of the presentation will be on all of the financial instruments that can be used 
and sometimes they're not used because people simply are not familiar with them so we want to make you familiar with these the linear economy has grown over time and has taken us to the time of the crisis that's a model where we manufacture and then throw things away but we have to think about what we're doing with all of this waste where are we throwing it those uh, all of these uh, cars and, and automobiles and so forth they all are going somewhere so it's very important to go back to the natural cycle because now we're just using 1.6 percent of the planet we have to start using resources in a much more sustainable way and the ideal thing is to not throw things away the product should not be considered waste at the end of its life there are new technologies at our disposal and there's new investigation going and there's uh, eco design so that we can remanufacture reuse update these um these appliances and not just recycle so these uh, the circular economy is much more than recycling now with the use this has already been mentioned but i'm going to reinforce the message but we need to think about whether we really need the product or is it the service that we need what is it that we need the service of the electrical appliance the television the, uh, the telephones and so forth or cars or do we need to possess them because we can change the system that will also generate new possibilities business opportunities because we're thinking about a new a new business model and then waste management that the commission presented in 2015 it presented an, an ambitious package regarding waste but also with the measures that we think we need to support all of these different steps in the circular economy now how this waste at the end can be used as resources resources as raw materials secondhand raw materials we could say so in terms of growth now if we do something we do this because we think that it's going to be profitable we believe in this because we've been working with companies as well as Jurgen said right now our commissioner with the director general who is Spanish Daniel Calleja who all of you know because he's given a lot of talks on circular economy are in China and they're working with big companies there and international organizations one of them is some are Spanish as well and they're talking about this change and talking about the need that we t for all of us to work together towards this change now what growth do we expect well in comparison with a linear uh, growth we're, can, we're talking about double we're talking about 1.8 billion euros and 3 million job posts that's two times what was created with what we call the linear economy in Spain specifically we expect growth and the creation of 160,000 job posts which is the double the 80,000 that are expected if we continue with the linear economy and exploring these new business opportunities now these new business opportunities let's talk about those in other words introducing product innovative products and services can generate a 7% growth in GDP and of course the profits in terms of economy and social and environmental uh, greenhouse gases can be reduced between two and four percent with this new model and the current model is not sustainable and we do need to make this change and this is an opportunity we don't interpret this as a forced uh, change this is an opportunity for growth we have the technology new technologies that we didn't have in the past and we need to continue research in along these lines today we're using 1.6 times the planet to supply demand and the middle class is growing which is very good but we have to we have to address that issue there's going to be more than double the middle class by 2050 another important factor is the vulnerability of resources 
companies are very vulnerable to the raw crisis. We've had the oil crisis, and today there is a lack of raw materials in the world. So we have to think how we can become stronger, more resilient to deal with this vulnerability. Now, if we recycle and if we know how to reuse and transform waste into raw materials, well, that's a huge competitive advantage. Europe imports many more resources than it exports. Europe imports six times more than it exports. We are living at the expense of others. And we generate five tons of waste per person per year. Per person. Each person here per year produces that amount of waste. And we only effectively recycle about one-third of that amount. But as I said, the Commission does not want this package to deal only with waste. What we're, we're going to explain how we're supporting all of the different stages of the circular economy. Now, the measures that we're implementing and the legislative proposals uh, the targets for the Commission for the member states are being approved at the Council and Parliament right now. Now, what are we doing exactly? We accepted a series of measures to reinforce during the first stage, the production stage, we want to support circular design, what we call eco-design. We support this with laws as well as with financing. The European financing and the agreement of the European Commission is developed according to the of the pyramid of waste. The first, the first thing we want to support is prevention. In other words, think how to design products so that they don't generate waste. It's through research and development and innovation using new technologies. Now, in terms of consumption, we have to think about how we can maintain the product going. You see, how we can maintain a product longer on the market and conserving the value of the product with maintenance. Maintenance is local work. This would not be outsourced. This would be local. And the next step would be the remanufacturing and reuse. How can we can make it recirculate longer? Now, if it's designed using this eco design, I can maintain it, I can update it, and I can have a version 7 or 8, for example, with a much higher value using less energy than if we simply recycle a mobile telephone. Maybe uh, we're saving two or three years through recycling, but if we change our idea from the very beginning and we think about the, uh, long-lasting products, products that we really want to recirculate in our society, then the companies will benefit because they're recycling, reusing their mobile uh, telephones, for example, that can use those same materials and that middle class, which is growing, as I said, and we can also benefit as citizens and consumers. Now, m management, the next step is once the, there's, no, there's no more value left, then it is does become waste, and the Commission supports proposals or obligations right now where we think it will be the best way to recycle this waste. And the ideal idea would be to recycle 100% using new technologies such that everything can turn back into a uh, raw material so that it be, can then go back to the design stage. That would be the ideal situation. Now, the sectors that we're focusing on that we think are the most important in creating greater profit for the society are plastics, food waste, critical raw materials, construction and demolition, biomass and biomaterials. Now, what have we done up until now? The European Commission 
has proposed this legislation based on waste. We have an action on public, uh, public ecological hiring. There's a lot of people here from the public sector. Has anyone, does anyone have experience with ecological hiring? There's a case in Barcelona, I believe, that have used this, um, this guide. It's in Spanish. I can send that to you. And you can, there's a, a high public hiring model based on ecology for buildings, for office materials, in Barcelona, I think also for uh, street cleaning and the collection of waste. And this has created a lot of job posts and a lot of services for citizens that makes our lives easier and it makes it easier for us to recycle. Also, we've improved practices in the reuse of water in Madrid, for example, is a good example. Madrid uses recycled water to clean the streets and to water plants and parks. And that's a, that's, a, that's a standard practice. And there's also a platform on food waste. We have a proposal, a draft a regulation on the reuse of materials and standards for secondary raw materials. But since we're focusing and supporting this sector, then we need to create standards to make sure that these secondary materials play the role in the cycle. And I'm going a little bit fast because I don't have much time and we're, I need to talk about financing. Now the initiatives that we're working on, as I said, eco-design, there's a lot of financing for this first stage, this preventive stage. The ecological label, we think it's important to know what impact this product will have in ecological terms. The, uh, the, fo the environmental footprint of the, of the products. We also need to know what that footprint is. In negotiations with legislative proposals in, on, uh, on waste, we established targets for that. The targets, as I said, and that 65% is the target of municipal waste should be recycled between now and 2030. 75% of plastics, of containers should be recycled and only 10% at most can be incinerated or uh, thrown into, um, into dumps, into waste dumps and bioeconomy and also communication of turning waste into energy, how we can take advantage of the, en the energy uh, of waste. And just to give you an idea, this is where we can see the different countries, Spain in this case, at European level compared to the most green and is, in, is in composting, recycling, and landfilling. Uh, Spain is below the European average, but it's important to point out that Spain has has focused on a very ambitious plan, the Paymar plan. Do you know that plan, the Paymar plan? You probably know it better than I do, where there are very ambitious targets and some of the highest targets or most ambitious targets in Europe. And those targets are for 2020. Therefore, that things will change and our ranking will change, I think, very soon. Now, financing. What is available to you? Well, we have a hard, the 2020 program, which is for innovation, uh, research and development, and a working plan for industry 2020 for the circular economy, which is f for 20, 2016, 2017. And we're also working for 2018 and the plan is more ambitious in terms of what we want to support in the circular economy. Now, these calls in the 2020 circular economy, we have 680 million euros set aside for that. The calls for 2017 are still open. So if you, I can talk 
during the coffee break, I can talk a little bit more in detail about that, but they're also on, you can find these on the web page that I'll show you right now. I'm going to also send to all of you uh, this sheet that I think will help you with all of the funds, and there's a link there where you can find the information, and I can send you that in PDF. I think that's easier than distributing copies around the room. Let's talk about uh, cohesion policy well, and uh, regional development and urban development here. I'm going to focus a lot more in cohesion where we have the greatest amount of support. The cohesion policy specifically is the ERDF funds. Spain right now uses the uh, ERDF and the uh, European Social Fund, and we are with these. We are supporting. Just to give you an idea, all of the cohesion policy accounts for 350 billion euros with the part private participation, and we're going to generate more than 500 billion euros in Spain in ERDF funds in 2014 2020. You have almost 20 billion euros in that fund. Now, those 20 billion euros, how are they distributed? Well, 2014-2020, we have 19 operational programs at regional level. Each region has its programs, plus the autonomous uh, cities as well. And about a little more than half of that budget is being managed by the national government. The national government has decided to use or to implement that financing through three operational programs, intelligent growth, sustainable growth, and the SME in, uh, initiatives. Here, uh, at regional level, it's important to know that these are at your disposal, and we need to know how you're going to implement this financing. We, there are obligations, for example, in Spain, two thirds of the 20 billion euros have to be devoted to R&D plus innovation, to SMEs, to uh, the ICT technologies, and low CO2 emission technologies. Now, how are they implemented? What projects are selected? Well, that depends on the national and regional authorities. But at the Commission, we believe that we have to change our uh, idea. We have to change our uh, environmental uh, ideas, our transport, and we are supporting increasingly R&D, innovation, SMEs, ICTs, and low CO2 emission technologies. Therefore, of those 150 million euros, this is for 150 billion, that's for all of Europe, that's being invested in those four priorities that I just spoke of. And we also have the Strategic Investment Fund, European Fund, we started with 315 billion, and given its uh, success, this uh, amount has been increased. And there's a proposal now for 630 billion euros that will be implemented or injected into the European economy between now and 2022. This is an initiative that we're proposing at the Commission by uh, Commissioner Juncker and uh, managed by the European Investment Bank. Also, through that same instrument, we're financing R&D, uh, environmental projects, sustainable projects, energy projects, renewable energy, of course. And we also have a life project. We have projects financed under life. This is a, not an instrument, it's a program with 3.4 billion euros in 2014-2020. Each year there are calls for projects. It has grants as well as financial instruments and support for NGOs. And the calls are closed for 2016, but there will be new calls uh, for 2017. On this sheet, you have the link as well, and it's on the web page as well, how to apply for financing. You can also take advantage of the projects financed through life. We have projects financed in the 2020 horizon. There's two or three there's and cohesion policy. We have many ERDF and ESF um, funds, so it is very possible to get financing. So what we tried to do today is to select projects that have benefited from this so that they can serve as a model and you can talk about how to access this funding. And to finish up, uh, finance 
the cosmic financial instrument that supports SMEs in general and uh, entrepreneurship access to financing for companies and the internationalization of those companies and has about 2.3 billion euros for that. Now the cohesion policy, I already explained this, the different areas that we focus on both in terms of energy efficiency. We have a specific section of 5.5 billion euros devoted used for waste management. Now, the important message, however, is that we're not only talking about managing these this waste. The important thing, and what we really support in the SMEs, R&D, and the ICTs, all is all included in this circular economy. And here, I'm going to send you this presentation. I would like also to mention an important thing in terms of innovation. We're working to be able to use ERDF funds, and the regions had to uh, develop an intelligent strategy. Now, right now, we're working in the community of Madrid in this intelligent technology. This is an exercise, a uh, bottom-up exercise, where we're applying a discovery, a business discovery process. And we're looking as a region where I can concentrate, what priorities I can establish, what key sectors I will support, the sectors that are going to make me more competitive, not only at national level, but also international. So in other words, it's uh, facing the, uh, the challenges of globalization. I also invite you to consult the Intelligent Specialization Platform. This is a platform to exchange best practices. There's very interesting information about ERDF funds there. And just to finish up, I wanted to mention that one of the national projects, the uh, SME initiative, we're managing that with the European or with the European Investment Bank Group. It's being managed by the Ministry of Finance and Public Administration. And this is an initiative that's implemented in 17 autonomous communities, almost all of them, and we have 18 million euros for that. We've signed contracts with nine banks. The banks are mentioned there so that you know where you can access financing. Now, this instrument is through the banks. We at the Commission and the European Investment Bank, we provide this financing that supports financing through the banks. It's 50-50 financing where 50% are public funds, European funds in this case, and the banks then will support as the most innovative SMEs, the SMEs that are having greater difficulty gaining access to financing and requiring uh, fewer, um, uh, fewer collateral, so uh, lower interest rates and so forth. In just nine months, because this data is just up to June, in, in nine months, we've achieved, we've been able to support two billion in financing, in volume, two billion in financing of, of SMEs because we have a leverage effect here where the minimum we have, that we established was four, but we expect that in communities like Catalonia, the best country in Madrid, to get up to seven or eight. And up till today, we've supported almost 20. 2,000 SMEs through this finance uh, scheme. Also, I'd like to mention what SMEs, so it doesn't seem so distant. The SMEs that we've uh, supported are small. Sometimes these are even micro companies because that's how the, uh, th that's the economy in Spain. 70% of these have, um, uh, have very few employees and a huge percentage has fewer than 50 employees so they're very small uh, companies and startups this was not an obligation but right now with the figures we're very happy to see that 20 percent of these smes were startups and identified as startups with in other words they've been in the market for fewer than three years and i think that with that i'm going to stop i could continue speaking on and on but we're going to send you this presentation with the links and all this information that I promised you on this, uh, on this sheet. Thanks very much.
Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Caterina. Now we know everything that we need to know about financing for SMEs in this area. Now we're going to listen to you. We open up the Q and A session. Would anyone like to uh, ask a question to either of our two speakers? Do we have a microphone here to pass around? The interpreter is waiting for the microphone to be passed around. I'm going to speak in Spanish. I understand English, but I apologize for I do not speak English. My question is for the English speaker. I wanted to thank you, thank the organizers and Catherine. My question. I come from the town of Mostoliz, from the town hall of Mostoliz, just outside of Madrid. I'm a politician, and my concern is the creation of employment. Uh, creation of employment at local level is difficult. In our case, in Mostoliz, the former government uh, left us in a very poor state of economy. And so how can we go from this linear economy to the circular economy? that we heard about in the first uh, in the first presentation how is that going to affect employment what kind of employment will be created through this project that the european commission is advocating those 260,000 jobs that are created or that they think they will create will they precarious jobs will be they will they be low quality jobs will they be exploiting young people what types of employment will be created there's a lot of economic studies that have been done all kinds of things are going to be accomplished, but there's no studies on what type of employment will be created by the circular economy. That's what I would like to know, please. Sorry for uh, replying in English. Uh, I think I understood the question. Uh, it was about the job creation and what kind of job and what level of quality of the jobs will be created as well. As I, as I said in my, um, in my presentation, it's really difficult to forecast in terms of numbers, of course, but there are a lot of things that can be said about some uh, material handling and, and recycling that has been done in a very uh, traditional fashion as if it was at the, end of the, at the end of the line. So there's no involvement of that workforce in getting the high level of quality of those materials. It was more getting rid of them. And then what kind of products can actually be servitized? Servitized? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I won't, uh, of the commission, I, I happily do that when they're not listening, but it, since they're here, <laughs> I'll just let them say. But what we, what we can see is that once you make the economic case for the company saying, you, if you derive your value from selling the service of your product, then your product remains your material bank. And actually, there's a lot of uh, profit in that strategy. And when you start putting the numbers together, they understand very quickly, and uh, probably earlier than us, to be honest, that uh, actually it's in their interest to start behaving like that. And you see, and of course you could say, well, it's moving too slow, and it's still very linear, and it's still throughput and volume-based. But you do see that uh, big companies such as uh, General Motors in the US investing 500 million in a car sharing service, you know, they are moving gradually to those systems. In the Netherlands, there is a company called Bundles that uh, leases you all the washing machines and dishwasher, etc. All these models are already emerging because there's a lot of uh, opportunity in there. Now, I I'll let the legislator talk about what they can do to promote these models. But for sure, there are uh, a lot of things that can be done. And uh, Sweden, for instance, uh, just uh, introduced a, a reduced VAT rate on the repair services to keep products longer in the, in the economy to make sure that the utilization rate is what goes up and not the volume sold. Yes. Uh, 
answer in Spanish. From the Commission's point of view, we are working on eco-design, but I want to focus on a particular aspect, namely financing. Our cohesion policy provides financing in R&D plus innovation. It's approached in a generic way. We can go through regional, national administrations, and you can go for this circular model for eco-design. Same applies to SMEs. The SMEs you might want to support. For example, you could have a call for proposals for sustainable companies for innovative proposals and that generates high quality jobs by developing new technologies. It's not necessarily so easy. We don't know everything we need to do here. There's a lot of research behind this. And for that we've got European and national funding. In Madrid we've got 50% European funding and 50% national funding. It's all about supporting these projects in this way. Same applies to ICTs, the digital agenda. It's a key sector in Madrid specifically. And all those projects that we might decide to support through our funding schemes. Same applies to Horizon, Horizon 2020. I say the same thing as Joyce. The company itself should think about the materials as their own assets. There are big companies supporting circular economy, investing in new technologies in order to recycle the materials they have so that they can secure themselves a group of consumers. If you produce, for example, a smartphone and for 20% more investment I can get another value. I'm going to be a, a, a faithful client, let's say. And the company will have the material, the material which will be recycled. The clients will give you that material back. And they will not focus so much on owning the products. The European Commission supports these projects legislatively, but not just the Commission, but rather the member states as well are on board. Thank you very much. If you move from those models, uh, and it's not only a question of legislation, you have, uh, I was uh, uh, in a conference recently and a gentleman from the OECD was saying that the linear, the policy was hardwired for linear economy, which is true because See, everything's precluded on the fact that you sell volume. So a company that wants to switch to that model also needs to find understanding when it comes to financing models. So if you go to your bank and say, I have a small business and I want to move from selling stuff to selling the service, people will say, mm, where's your cash flow going to come from? And actually you need to bridge that gap because if suddenly rather than selling cars and selling X number of cars each month, you are selling the usage. Of course, what comes in is spread over a longer term. So you also need to get all the system on board and get to understand that the return on investment might be a bit slower, but it will be more resilient and, uh, and longer term. So it really is important that all the actors and not only legislators understand what kind of model we're talking about. Vamos a tomar, bueno, dos preguntas más. Okay, a couple of Questions? Yes. So you're saying that the European Commission supports and states support as well? I'm Jose Milar. Okay, that's very good. We have that support. In Sweden, there's a lot of support for reuse lower taxes and so on. But in Spain, if we want to go for an electric car, the government supports 40% for a company, but for an individual, that individual doesn't get any support. So 
to what extent is the support so real? That's what I wanted to point out. So please, we need to be aware of what we say and what is real. Uh, coffee might cost 40 cents in the parliament, but it might be much more expensive in the street for the average citizen. So we need to be aware of that. So to what extent does Spain support these projects, just in case I'm running against your hypothesis? Does Spain actually support reuse? We also have people from the ministry. And we can check with them during the break. But there's an important thing. For example, the targets we have set for Spain, for example, with the ERDF funds, two-thirds of this funding has to be invested in this. So it's a new thing. We're thinking about 2020, even though we're still in 2016. We are witnessing this change right now. Uh, as I said, Spain is below the average, but according to the information I have, I think that this is one of the most ambitious targets pursued by Spain in comparison with other member states, so we are confident that this change is going to take place to be successful. Okay, we're running short of time, so we'll just pay attention to two more questions. We'll have more time later. Okay, you've got the microphone there. Very good. Good morning. I want to address this question to Katarina very directly. I think the PIMA initiative is very interesting. I just wanted to ask what is the real mechanism between the European Commission and the SME? Because I think this funding comes from private banking. So what mechanisms does the small or medium-sized enterprise have, the SME, in order to apply this initiative, especially as related to assuming risks, for example, high-risk technological projects? How does it work? Fernandez. I work for the public transportation company of Madrid. I am in charge of European projects and European funds. Um, I have a double question, actually. Um, within the presentations, uh, when um, Jocelyn was introducing uh, the topics, he was explicitly mentioning the car use, the transportation. Afterwards, within uh, Katharina, Katharina presentation, the transportation is not included within those priority sectors. But if I'm not wrong, there is one upcoming core of innovative uh, urban initiatives which explicitly mentions uh, circular economy plus mobility and transportation. So I wonder in which of those funding schemes is this upcoming call included and if there is any, I don't know, let's say, um, not blocking, but if any administration tries to look for funding for any mobility or transportation initiative linked to this circular economy, um, is there any sort of um, barrier or problem for us to do it? Uh, I'll answer over here. When I mentioned transport, I meant infrastructures, roads, airports, high-speed trains, what used to be funded in the past, but in this program for 2014, there are limitations. Of course, we want to support urban initiatives. Of course, two-thirds of 20 billion euros have to be invested in these priorities, but 5% 1 billion euros have to be invested in urban initiatives. Of course, there we're talking about circular economy, projects of car hiring. I'm not familiar with 
the projects here in this respect, but in Brussels it's very common to share cars. And we just have one car per family, for example, because it's very complicated to park the cars and pollution, traffic jams. So I wasn't specifically talking about clean urban transport, innovative transport. And then answering to Raoul's question, the thing is, we negotiate with the member state and Spain is going for this initiative. The Spanish government was a pioneer and is going for this initiative with more funding. The other member states are supporting this initiative but with much less funding. So it's sort of cooperation between the European Commission and Spain with its regions because it's the regions that give the funding in order to reach the 800 billion euro, euros. So 800 million euros are going to be used in Spain in order to support these initiatives. 3.2 billion euros could end up in the Spanish economy and the leveraging could be even bigger in certain regions in Spain. It's a very big instrument, a very useful instrument. The ERDF are based on sharing management. We just monitor the initiatives, but the European Investment Fund negotiates this. They sign agreements with banks. There are new banks in this respect, having signed Cooperativo Liberbank, and the other eight banks have been there for longer, since October last year. And the point is to negotiate that 50% has to go for new portfolios. That means I'm supporting you with that money, that money can be used for more innovative, riskier projects as well, Risks are shared and the bank takes up only 50% of the risk and that way we can go and help more ISMEs that might have more difficulties in getting collateral. Thank you very much. If there are other questions, I think we, we can have those questions during the break and we'll go to our second panel. Thank you very much for your participation, very lively. And thank you, Josh and Katerina. Thank you very much.